fuck back. Um, so one of the biggest things that I like to talk to people about when it's dealing with meds and passing out meds and you're the med aide and not the nurse and you're dealing with these clients that are cognitively impaired, that can be a little bit of a doozy for some of my um, people who are don't really understand the full imperative of cognitive impaired meds um, or what to do when the client is unaware of what's going on. So first, let's talk about cognitive impairment. Now, this is an impaired or damaged style of thinking. Now, wait, wait, wait. I know that y'all saying, you know, I know some people who are not elderly that have that. That is the truth. Some of them are diagnosed and some of them are not. But at any rate, we're going to talk about the ones that are diagnosed. Okay, now the main systems of memory loss and confusion is what we're talking about. We're talking about cognitive impairment. Also, this is not a normal part of aging. Some people are in their 90s and they do not have damaged or impaired thinking. All right, now there is a term that I want you to become familiar with that's called dementia. Dementia is a brain disorder that results in some cognitive impairment. There could be some acute dementia or there could be chronic dementia. Now that acute dementia is reactions to medication, metabolic problems, their endocrine abnormalities, um, nutritional deficiencies, infections, poisoning, uh, brain tumors, um, uh, conditions in which the brain oxygen supply um, either was reduced or uh, cut off entirely. And they can also get this kind of um, problem, acute dementia, from heart and lung problems. But then let's talk about the difference, like what is chronic dementia. Chronic dementia is things like Alzheimer's disease, which you also may see as AD. This is chronic. They may have progressive brain disease that eventually will destroy their cognition. Um, and AD, which is Alzheimer's disease, is the most common type of chronic dementia. Um, there are different stages of Alzheimer's disease, and I know we've already talked about them, but let's just do a little bit of do to do. Um, there's the early stage, that's where they have a little bit of mild declining. Um, it is often only recognized by like family members or caregivers. Some of the symptoms that you may see are things like difficulty remembering names and words, uh, difficulty with challenging task problems, with organizing and planning. Um, they may have some short-term memory loss, which affects the, which is affected before their long-term memory loss. So it doesn't mean like they misplaced their keys. That don't mean that you have early signs of dementia, child, because sometimes I can have my glasses in right on top of my head, and I'm like, where are my glasses? I don't, I don't have dementia, okay? That, that, that's just, you know, I don't know, all right? Then we have the mild stage of, of dementia. This will need um, greater amount of care. So some of the symptoms that we see with that are that they may become very easily angered or upset by things that they wouldn't have before in the past. They may confuse words, you know, interchange words that don't really go. Um, they may have personality changes, also may have problems sleeping having issues controlling their bowel or their bladder, and um, they are at, at an increased risk for wandering once they are mild in a mild developmental stage of dementia. Now, they may not be able to remember past events, long-term friends at that time, family members, or even basic information like what's their address, what's their telephone number, uh, some of the things that they would normally do. They may forget some of their regular ADLs like um, taking a bath, uh, dressing. These things could be very, very challenging for them. Now for the late stage, now this is the final stage and the symptoms is that they will have communication difficulty. It becomes very problematic for them to communicate. They may not respond to others or their environment. Uh, they may not have control over any body movement, like they can no longer walk, they can no longer eat. Um, and at this point, most of them do need around the clock care. Now, effects of Alzheimer's disease, there are several effects that we note and we watch. Uh, they may have some progressive deterioration or behavior and personality changes and problems, impaired learning, impaired thinking, impaired judgment, 
impaired memory, and also impaired impulse control. Now, some of these people are who you will note in uh, different areas like living facilities or private care, um, client, private client care, where they may, you know, um, hit or become disruptive. Um, it could be simply because of the Alzheimer's disease. Now, the abilities that are spared, you know, in Alzheimer's disease, so things that are not lost, is emotions and feelings. They do not lose that. So please don't act like they don't have emotions and feelings. And they do not lose physical strength. So baby, they will knock you out. Okay? Not that they know why they hit you, but baby, they do have strength. Also, they may have a sense of uh, vision, um, hearing, taste, smell, touch. You know, those things are not lost just due to Alzheimer's disease. Um, they may actually not lose habits that they've been doing for a long time. Like they may still be able to play the piano if you sit them at it. Or they may still know how to do cycling motions. Now, some behavior responses to cognitive impairment or things like memory loss, confusion or disorientation, or a lack of self-control. Now, some of our clients will have special needs at this particular time. So, they will provide the resident with physical needs. This is what we should do. So, establish a routine of care for them. So, then they become used to what's going on and try to always stay with the schedule. But be flexible if needed. Provide direction and encouragement to the resident to assist with care as much as possible. Ask them. Ask the resident if they have pain. Um, look to see if they're grimacing or showing signs of pain and report that to the nurse so that we can help them with that because they may not be able to just verbalize to you that they are having some pain. We also want to make sure that for these clients that are having some cognitive difficulties that we're paying attention to their safety needs. We want to practice and provide a very safe environment to avoid risk of uh, problems happening. Risk as directed. So what we want to make sure is that we understand what the care plan is for this patient. We need to understand what they can and cannot do so that we can make sure that they're, we're not increasing any risk for them. Now, so other special needs are things like being supportive. They may need supportive needs. You want to always approach them very calmly. You want to make sure that you're doing things like make sure their rooms are well lit, you know, so in case they're disoriented, they can see everything that's going on. We want to recognize when the resident is becoming frustrated or when the resident is, uh, you know, seeming disoriented. You want to offer some assistance. You want to be helpful to them. Uh, also, limit their decision making based on the responsibilities of the resident's ability to do things, okay? Like giving directions. You know, you might not want to give them two, three directions at a time, okay? And also, you become a part of the team and caring with the nurse so that you can understand what is the care plan for them when it comes to helping them uh, with their daily activities. Do not attempt to force the resident to think or remember. Miss Sarah, what did you have for dinner? What did you have for dinner? What did you have for dinner? What you, do you remember? Do you know? When you get frustrated if somebody kept doing you like that and you knew that you were supposed to know, but you didn't. So that's why we don't approach them like that. And you want to orient them to their name, place, date, and time. Which is why a lot of times we have a big board that says, this is today's date. Or a big board that has the clock. You know, um, on their doors, on their rooms. It only has a picture of them. Their name. You want to continue to orient them to that kind of stuff. Now, you also want to use positive body language as it may be the only message that the resident can receive. So if you're looking like you are, you know have had an awful day. You may look angry to them. You may look like you want to do something ugly to them. And then you come to them like, here's your meds. Well, now they're going to be, they, they may see that as aggressive or now they're scared. They don't know if they should take it. So you always want to go in 
Hello, Miss Smith. How are you doing today? Oh, that's great. What are you watching? Oh, Gunsmoke. That's Gunsmoke. Oh, yeah. Gunsmoke is on. Oh, yeah. I have your meds for you. Very different. Okay. But you also want to watch the client's body language because, honey, side note, Miss Williams, Professor Williams got clocked real good one time by a demented patient. And she was being just as sweet as pie. I did not realize that she was going to hit me. I was not paying attention to the signs because I was doing something else. And this was when I was in nursing school. I'm talking. I'm doing something else. She's right here. She clocked me real good as we walked down that hallway. Sure did. Pay attention to their body language because, you know, it may be only sending a message that you need to be paying attention to. Speak slowly and calmly to them. Greet them by their preferred name and make eye contact. Now, here's one of the things. You don't want to refer to your clients as honey baby sugar. Now, I know sometimes we're in the South and people like to respond to people by honey baby sugar, but that, not, that may not be what they are comfortable with. So you need to understand what is their preferred name that they want you to call them and you be respectful enough to do it the same way every time and make good eye contact. And you want to identify yourself. Hi, I'm Sherry. I am your nurse today. I am a registered nurse. Identify yourself, your name and your title and explain what you're going to do for them that day. Give them simple and easy instructions and ask only simple questions and wait for a response. But only repeat if necessary. Avoid using no and don't. Don't, don't touch that, Mr. Smith. No, put that down. Because what does that sound like? That sounds like you're being aggressive and that you're disrespecting like they are a child. And people who are adults do not like that. You don't like it. They don't like it. When you're giving them um, guidelines of what it is that you want them to do, you will say, Mr. Smith, hold your water cup. As he holds the water cup, Mr. Smith, go ahead and take one little sip of water so I can make sure that you're drinking okay. He'll take the one sip of water. Okay, Mr. Smith, I'm going to give you your pills now. Do you want to take them all together or one at a time? Then he'll tell you, and then you follow suit. You don't walk in there and say, Hey, Mr. Smith, my name is Sherry Williams, and I'm your nurse today. I'm going to give you your medication. So what you're going to do first is hold this cup, drink some water. I'm going to go ahead and make sure you're swallowing okay. Then I'm going to give you some pills, and then I'm going to want you to drink it down with water, okay? Mr. Smith don't know nothing you said, right? Now, that's why it's important to do it that way. Now, let's talk about behavior management. Now, reorient the resident to name, place, date, and time anytime that it's necessary. Do not validate false thinking, which may result in increased confusion. Okay? Do not correct residents with a negative message that may result in withdrawal or anger. Here's an example. Validating false thinking. They say, y'all see that monster? That monster is coming to get me. You will never say, oh, oh yeah, sure is. Because now they know you see it too. And they was confused on if that was what they saw. Do not validate false thinking. Do not correct resident with negative messaging. Don't. No, don't. Don't do that to them. And don't continue to repeat in a aggressive tone that may just make them withdraw or become a little bit more angry now there are a few guidelines for assisting residents who would wander now you want to allow the resident to wander if it's non harmful like if they're in a locked unit that's fine but you also want to make sure that you're ensured that the resident who wanders wear appropriate identification and that they if there is a um, appropriate security measure 
Uh, sometimes they have these little uh, bracelets on that has a little alarm. Make sure that they are safe. Ensure that the appropriate doors and windows are locked and the alarms are always turned on. Try to redirect your client uh, with something else to do, something interesting to do, or an activity that they may like to do. Look for causes of wandering, which may include seeking an exit. They may have some restlessness. They may be stressed or bored, or they have an unmet need. You know, they go looking for how to solve it themselves. Always follow the instructions of the nurse and the behavior management uh, when it comes to dealing with your client that has that. Now, some guidelines for assisting clients who resist care. You want to make sure that you keep a simple routine. Be very, very calm, patient with the client. Don't rush them. If they're resistant, you just stand there. You just wait. You just ask questions. I do understand that you may have other clients. You may have other things. But, you know, there's a way that we can keep their routine simple, make sure they're calm, so that we can go ahead and move on to the next client. Now, resisting care often occurs when the caregiver abilities require skills that the cognitive impaired resident no longer has. And the match, uh, the demand of the care to the responsibilities of the resident, it doesn't match. So that is where some of the resisting of care happens. You may be asking them to brush their teeth. You may think that they're resisting it and they're just telling you no. In effect, it may be that they don't remember how. All right. Observe the signs of anxiety and body language that would indicate early resistance to care, such as shifting positions, clutching their fists, restlessness, uh, ringing of the hands, or moaning and groaning, or you know, you know, looking like they're becoming very anxious. At the first sign of distress, stop the care, and as soon as you can safely do so. Making me hot, y'all. Just give me a minute, it's kind of moving a little bit slower on my notes. I surely hate that for myself. Here we go. Okay. Now, some guidelines for assisting residents who resist care. You want to report the behaviors to the nurse. Uh, the caregiver who has to get the job done may be experiencing uh, or expecting too much from the resident, rushing the resident, uh, poor communication with the resident, uh, or them having their own anxieties or impatience with the resident. So sending mixed messages to the resident is not gonna do anything but heighten their irritability and their confusion. Also, we want to provide care following the instructions from the nurse and according to the care plan to eliminate the causes such as to meet any unneeds for the client. Delaying care until the resident is no longer exhibiting signs of distress is a good way to help manage the behaviors and simple tasks will provide additional assistance, slow it down for the patient as well. We want to make sure that for our client's self-control problems, that we want to allow the resident to do as much as problem uh, possible, uh, but assist uh, them to decrease anxiety and frustration. Help them, but don't do it for them. 
sometimes when we do it for them, it's for us. It's really not for them. It's so that we can go ahead and get the job done. Know and avoid situations that lead to loss of self-control for the resident. Redirect the resident's thoughts and or activity before they become agitated. Just, you know, guide them to doing something else. Use measures to comfort and redirect the residents. Remove the residents from the private space before self-control uh, is lost. So put them in a private space before it is lost. Provide care and indications to eliminate the cause of the behavior. Some of you guys will see some of your residents walking around with um, baby dolls, you know, and things like that. And a lot of that is just simply comfort for them. Um, or they'll be sitting around doing little tasks like folding towels. These kind of things keep their irritation down, okay? Now, here are the last things. Guidelines for assisting residents with catastrophic reactions. Now, a catastrophic reaction is an emotional outburst, which may lead to crying, screaming, agitation, or even fighting that is out of control of the resident. Now, try to avoid stressful situations and multiply distractions or overstimulations, okay? Approach the resident very calmly, reassuring them that everything is going to be okay because they're acting out uh, because they're, they just have lost control. Give verbal and nonverbal support. Do not scold them, argue them. You know, you're not, you're not teaching them like, we're not supposed to fight. Like, this is not preschool, okay? Try to comfort them, redirect them um, with an object, their favorite thing to do, their favorite show to watch, things like that. Lead the resident um, into a situation where you can just safely leave uh, them, you know, where you can monitor them to calm down in a safe place. Provide care that may assist them in controlling their behavior and self-calming down. Okay, but you always want to follow up with the nurse. Let them know about what has happened uh, and their behavioral situations so that if we have to come up with a behavioral plan, then we're all, as their medical team and professionals, will come up with that together to assist in our client's safety and their um, ability to help us help them.